let's look at the K omega SST turbulence model. And it has a very similar form here, where if we look at the turbulent viscosity, we have the turbulent kinetic energy. But if we look down here, the, the denominator right here, it has one of the first things that you see in here, it's got a limiter in it. This max term says, well, actually pick one of the values, either the largest of these two values, either this value or these values. And we're gonna talk more about what each one of these terms mean, um, <clears throat> but it does a ratio of these two, but it's kind of nominally the same relationship. And we'll look at that more closely here. Uh, but you have a turbulent kinetic energy, you have the same terms, you have a production term, which is a little bit different. You have the dissipation term, which looks a little bit different. We're gonna look at these in more detail. <clears throat> I just wanna kind of have these equations out here for reference uh, when people look at this later. This is all of the terms of the K omega SST turbulence model, and it looks pretty simple. All we have are you know, some terms that look very similar to the K epsilon turbulence model. But the details are, you know, significantly different in how these terms are put together. So let's just start by um, talking about the K omega SST turbulence model and what its purpose is. And the K omega SST turbulence model really is kind of a combination of the K epsilon turbulence model and the K omega turbulence model. These two approximations kind of blends the two of them together because um, mentor, the person that kind of spearheaded this, noted that the K omega turbulence model, it does a really good job. It has some really um, powerful numerical properties right near solid walls, and which is very desirable because that's where a lot of, you know, the flow structures, and I mean, that's basically frames most of our problems is near the wall, and you'd like to get, to get that right. But the problem is, is like in the, in the far stream, it does not do a good job. It has problems, it has numerical issues out there. Um, you have uh, dissipation issues and, and it just, it has problems out there. In the K epsilon turbulence model, um, that is known to have more difficulty near the wall. Uh, it has to do with how epsilon, how you characterize epsilon as it approaches the wall. Uh, it's more, much more challenging and it scales differently uh, and I don't know that we really need to dig into those details, but simply say it's more challenging. But it does a really good job in the bulk flow. Uh, and so it'd be nice if we could kind of have one of the models that blends these two together. And that's what the K omega SST turbulence model does is it blends the K omega and the K epsilon model together. But there's one other aspect of the K omega SST turbulence model it does is it uses a bunch of heuristics to bound the turbulent flow variables in general. And so people have kind of put together, like I know how high the turbulent kinetic energy should be in this area. And it's pretty well documented fairly well that the K epsilon turbulence model violates these uh, situations uh, at times. And, and that's not desirable. You'd like to try to keep these, these types of things in check and make sure that those things are reasonable. So this turbulence model used is bounding or heuristics to kind of crop the solution in these areas, which is good because it keeps things bounded, but it also can lead to numerical instability because anything that has an if statement or truncation in it uh, makes it much more challenging to solve numerically. <clears throat> so. so let's just first start and look at the comparison between the turbulent viscosity uh, between the two models here. And Right down here on the bottom, you can see there's a relationship between the epsilon equation and the omega equation. And if you kind of take this epsilon uh, and you solve for omega and you stick it in here, you actually get the uh, standard K epsilon relationship as long as you take the left hand uh, value here in this max term. Okay. So it's basically the same thing unless you hit this max and this max value, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. This, this is one of those, uh, you know, magical turbulence things that I don't fully understand, but people have found we need to truncate that. It can't get too big. And this is one way of doing that. So, and so once we have this turbulent 
viscosity of here, I thought maybe it'd be good to understand what happens to that turbulent viscosity and how it's used in the primary variables. And right over here on the right, we have the equation that's used. So we basically, the, the effective viscosity, the effective thermal conductivity, the effective diffusivity, these are the values that are used when these fundamental um, variables are solved within the solver. And it is basically, so for the effective viscosity, it's the sum of the laminar viscosity and the turbulent viscosity. And for many of the things, almost all of the things that we do, this value right here, this turbulence value, is very large. It's usually orders of magnitude larger than your viscosity. And, and at times it almost doesn't really even matter what you choose for this. Not that we shouldn't ignore choosing the right value here, but many times this value just overwhelms everything else. For the thermal conductivity, it's scaled by, uh, you know, here's another empirical constant here in order to get the effective viscosity. We have this turbulent viscosity, but we also have a turbulent Prandtl number, which is now also another constant that is chosen that seems to give us about the right answer. And likewise, uh, the Schmidt number is used for the diffusivity. But these are all used, we look at them frequently, especially, especially the effective viscosity. If we are wondering, why is our pressure drop change so much? And when my turbulence model, when I change it, a, a turbulence model boundary condition, uh, and this can have a big impact on that. So let's now jump right into the turbulent kinetic energy comparison here. So on the top here, we have basically the standard K epsilon and the K omega SST is down here. And most of the terms are all the same. You have this effective value right here. And you'll notice this effective value here is divided by this tilde value. And this tilde value is really kind of, you go over here and it gets a little more interesting because this tilde value is kind of a blended value between two values. And this is where the blending between the two turbulence models really come into play. You have essentially a kind of a K1 value for the K epsilon turbulence value, and then the K2 value, which would be presumably from the K omega SST or the K omega turbulence model. And you're kind of blending between the two based on this F1 value. So we're kind of blending between the two of those and changing this equation right here to look like either the K uh, omega value relationship or the K epsilon relationship just by this blending process that takes place there. <clears throat> the other thing that's a little interesting when you look at between the two, in the K epsilon turbulence model, uh, we just take the production rate. We just take it as is. In the K omega SST turbulence model, we say, ah, actually, we're going to look a little more closely at this and we're going to take the minimum of the turbulent production or this empirical relationship right here, which we'll look at a little more closely in a minute. So we we're introducing a little bit more truncation, which kind of what I was talking about. We're kind of bounding the turbulent kinetic energy to keep it in an area that we think might be more reasonable. <clears throat> So now the dissipation, it has a similar relationship here where, you know, we have the constants, you have this blending process. It also notice in here, just to be like a little inconsistent here, the turbulent production rate that's used in the KOMA, they use the unbounded version in the dissipation rate. I'm not sure why they chose to do that, but that's what they do. The other thing that uh, is important to look at when we're looking at this also is that the dissipation rate here, the omega term also has a gradient of the turbulent kinetic energy and a gradient of the variable itself, omega. And so this is where I talk about the implementation of these things and the implications of how that gradient is calculated can strongly impact how this term right here behaves and the final value of the omega values that are ultimately calculated here can be impacted by 
the like the internal mechanism of how the implementation of these is performed. <clears throat> and so this the, the omega equation is a little bit more complex because it's self-dependent on gradients and more dependent on gradients themselves. Um, and even the production gradient is unbounded. <laughs> so now let's just talk about this blending function. And we're going to look at these cascade of, of, of um, choices that are made in order to bound this. So we have this blending function right here that blends the variable between these two values. And this F1 is a hyperbolic tangent of this gamma one, which is raised to the fourth power, which is a, a big number. And so, well, okay, well, how do you get that number? Well, that number, well, first we're gonna look at the turbulent kinetic energy, the square root of the turbulent kinetic energy, as well as the dissipation rate, a constant, and this d perpendicular. The d perpendicular is the distance from the nearest wall. And that seems like kind of an interesting value to have because we know that turbulence is really kind of functionally dependent heavily on where the nearest wall is. So having that in there seems to make a fair bit of sense. So we have the dependence on a wall, but we kind of characterize it by, you know, this magic number 500 squared and omega. So we take you know, the max of those two. Well, not only that, when we take the minimum, we also kind of take it back over here and we look at it, well, we have the density, we have this other constant, we have the turbulent kinetic energy, and then we have this CD KW value, which in again, is something that we look at, which is again, functionally dependent on a gradient. Not only a gradient, a gradient of the two variables that we're trying to solve. So it's gonna make things a little more complicated here. And the choice about whether or not this is activated becomes highly dependent on the implementation of these gradients and whether they're large or small really depends on whether or not this is going to be activated. And then, there is a number like e to the minus 10 chosen. People have chosen and they changed this number over the years, e to the minus nine, e to the minus 11. It probably depends a lot on, are you solving this single precision, double precision? This is, you know, all of these choices, there's a cascade of choices that are made here in this blending function that results in how those constants are blended together with one another. <clears throat> So this is one of the blending functions. So now let's talk about this limiting function. So now we're going to limit our effective viscosity here. And we're looking at the fluid strain rate. That's what this ST value represents, is the fluid strain rate. And once again, now this value right over here is becoming very functionally dependent on our velocity gradients. And that means that, like, you know, I'm just talking about, like, that means that you know, poor quality cells where you might have uh, anomalous velocities for the moment, they're all of a sudden going to impact our effective viscosity in a, in a kind of a, a, a spot wise way. So any low mesh quality um, that you might have in your model is all of a sudden going to become more sensitive because you're instituting this in here. So this can actually get activated. Um, so if you have say for instance, an anomaly in your mesh that results in a high viscosity, it's gonna activate and this could in fact become activated here. So, but that's the choices that are made in this turbulence model. So, and then we also have this F2 number, which is another hyperbolic tangent relationship, which is in itself dependent again on the distances from the wall, as well as you know, this choice of 500 over D squared omega. So like it, it chooses, you know, some value here and it tends off um, to come up with the relationship that is used for our effective viscosity. So now the K omega SST turbulence model, I thought just throw in here what the wall distance looks like. What you're really going to see when you have the K omega SST turbulence model enabled in Azor, there's gonna be an additional field in there and that's the wall distance. Perhaps that might be interesting to look at at some point. Here is a display of one of the a model and it shows you know, basically values that are higher are larger distances from the wall. 
<clears throat> and that it seems like a, a good thing to have.